You can't move for TV makeover gurus. They're rifling through your bins. This is just bags of rubbish. They're rifling through your fridge. Yuck. They're rifling through your wardrobe. They make your ass look huge. There's probably one standing behind you right now, filming the back of your head for a programme called How Shit Is The Back Of Your Head. Go on, have a look. Have a look. Go on. Ugh. I think the burning question about all TV makeover gurus is this. If they've got all the answers to life in their pocket, why do they look so bloody unhappy? OK, look at Gillian McKeith, for instance. Christ, Gillian, surely things can't be that bad. OK, so your whole show's just an excuse for the middle classes to sneer at pie-eating chaps, but you can at least fake a smile, couldn't you? Actually, no, she can't. Have you ever seen her try to smile? She looks like she's trying to shit out a pine cone, which, I suppose, given her dietary advice, she probably is. While I'm shouting at sad-looking women, what about Nikki Hambleton-Jones, presenter of Ten Years Younger, the show that encourages you to take a surgical buzzsaw to your own face? She scarcely even looks real. She's more like a kid's drawing on the back of a spoon. How dare she tell us what to do with our faces when she hasn't even grown one of her own yet? Anyway, the latest addition to the miserable guru club is Anthea Turner, who appears in BBC Three's Perfect Housewife, in which she plays a woman who looks as though she's never managed to come in her life and has filled that void by becoming obsessed with cleanliness and order. All you need is a system, a foolproof system. Great concept for a show, this woman living a cushy life in a giant mansion berates a bunch of hapless ordinaries for their slovenly lives. They have come to a point in their life when they've, they've given up. I can't believe that there are jam jars on the table. Yeah, mess seems to genuinely infuriate Anthea. She takes it personally and often looks like she's about to lamp someone. The trouble with Perfect Housewife is it wants it both ways. On the one hand, it holds Anthea up to be a genuine domestic goddess. Housework isn't something you do in your spare time. It's to give you spare time. And on the other, with its mock kitsch graphics and its tongue-in-cheek commentary, it's just taking the piss out of her. Because we all know what's going to happen when an exacting Anthea sees crisps on paper plates. So whose side is it on? Is it on Anthea's side or is it on humankind's side? Well, the answer is... It's on nobody's side but its own. It's a TV programme. It's just going to sit there and sneer at everyone because that's what TV programmes do. They sneer and sometimes they just roll around slapping their bums <coughs> on the sofa because they're so bloody f***ing pleased with themselves. Gary Lockett takes on Ryan Rhodes, a live boxing on ICB4 now. But here there's some strong language in Parkinson. Now here's comedian Simon Farnaby with a show he feels is much maligned. Last of the Summer Wine is actually the longest running sitcom in the world. That's not just Britain, that's the world. And, you know, you would think we'd be proud as a nation of this record-breaking show. But of course we're not. You know, it's uncool. It's for old fogies. Well, you know, good. I urge people, I say, go back, look at you know, anywhere from series 3 to 12, and there's some absolutely, I mean, some brilliant stuff. He just had three blokes, Compo, Cleggy and Foggy, and all they did basically was wander around the countryside trying to find things to do before they pop their clogs. And one of the supreme tests of physical fitness is how long you can hold your breath. In the days of my prime, I could do well over a minute. In fact, I was very tempted to volunteer for a frog man. You got the face for it. <laughs> Literally nothing happens. I mean, Samuel Beckett could have written it. And you always wonder, when you're watching the start of Last of the Summer Wine, what am I looking at here? Why am I looking at a load of trees? And I think, well, why not have a look at some trees? Trees are nice. And then the camera sort of pans onto our homeless heroes. Because you never see where they live, these people, so they are essentially tramps 
and you've got Compo playing in the stream there with his little boat, and then Cleggy philosophising, and then Foggy, who is one of the best sitcom characters of all time, has this incredible bout of existential ennui. Oh, my God, I was afraid of this when I had to retire. It's so easy to drift into uselessness. And his solution, I think, is just sublime. I am going to yonder bridge. There I shall station myself in such a position that I can observe the life in the water below. I shall blend into the background so as I become as one with the stonework. And there I shall record in my notebook the detailed observation of the fish life of the stream. What you get a lot in Last of Summer Wine, which I really love, is you get the thoughts that crop into your head when you're bored of all normal thought, especially from Cleggy. I think he is a very interesting. Have you ever thought that if they were more square, how the corners would tend to cut the pillow? <laughs> you get these weird camera angles. It's one they use with a hyper-long lens where the camera seems to be miles away and the characters are kind of silhouetted on some horizon, but you can hear them like they're right next to you, which has this very odd effect. When you come up here, you realise how small a creature man is. And you wonder why he should be standing on other people's feet. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> One of the many criticisms aimed at Last of Summer Wine is the acting style, especially where Compo is concerned. <laughs> It's grotesque. Yeah, grotesque. I look at Bill Owen's performance as Compo and I go, good on you, Bill. You know, why not? I hope I'm fighting librarians, shouting, uh, molesting old ladies. You know, at his age, he does well, especially after all the fags he smoked. Oh, you must have lungs like tangled bootlaces. Lend us a quid. You hear the youngsters, the kids, going, ah, oh, no, nah, I don't want to watch that. My gran watches that. And I'm like... Why is that a reason not to watch it? Your grand's lived through wars and things. She's seen loads of telly. I think you should listen to your gran rather than your mate who watches coupling just so he can go and beat off over the girls later on. There's no eye candy in Last of the Summer Wine. This is not the land of the beautiful people. And good, you know, I don't need to see attractive people hanging around in front of my eyes when I'm trying to have a laugh. I want to see hideous old people who don't care anymore. Now that's funny. <laughs> Maybe it is just for old people, but aren't we all going to be old someday, hopefully? And I hope that Last of Summer Wine's still around, because I think I'd like to spend my afternoons pushing my best mate down a hill in a tin bath on wheels. I think that'd be good. I don't know. Is it any good? What do you think? Nah, it's rubbish. Docu-soaps have a habit of throwing up grotesque and colourful characters. Take Maureen from Driving School, for instance. Whoa! Whoa! For Christ's sake! She could have killed someone! Or what about that Lizzie Barsley from Wife Swap, a woman who looks like she could punch a train unconscious if she wanted to? Don't give my husband permission to smoke, oh, you need snooty f***ing oh, me! Generally speaking, the more hideous the person, the greater the level of fame the nation will eventually bestow on them. By which logic, it's worth placing a bet now on BBC Two's The Armstrongs having the Christmas number one. Ten years ago, John Armstrong met Anne, and it was an instant attraction. Joining forces in marriage and business, they set out to become multi-millionaires. Together, they've built UFIT, Coventry's third largest double glazing company. You know how everyone has certain types of food that make them shudder and go, Ugh. well, if you take that Ugh feeling and magnify it by about a thousand, that's what the Armstrongs are like. For some reason, I imagine the world starts to smell faintly of scotch egg every time they walk into the room. There was shit up the wall. At sort of shoulder level, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, I'm tall, but even I couldn't shit at that level. Anne is a sexless, slightly chirpy frump who somehow, visually, sums up the year 1989. I mean, let's be honest, we're not exactly stuck in the dark ages. While John is a sort of Tolkien-esque new potato, he also looks like one of those troll dolls. 
Together, they treat the UFIT workforce with the sort of tact and charm normally associated with an aggravated burglary. Dad, fucking let him go. We don't need wankers like that. We've got enough other ones. Not, fucking believe it. Not that they don't try and treat their staff nicely. I mean, at Christmas, they threw them a party and they got them all presents. Look, that is going to be dangerous because by the time we give that to somebody, it's going to be half defrosted. Ah, fuck them. Yeah, despite their best efforts, the workforce at UFIT are on a mental low ebb, so the Armstrongs decide to hire a motivational guru called Basil Meany, who looks like a cross between a vintage Radio 1 DJ and a haunted grandfather clock, and whose advice shines with a brilliant clarity. You guys are on a pig's back right now, and if, if I were you, I would be mocking it for every cent I could. Sadly, Basil's advice doesn't impress everyone. What that Basil was saying was a load of bullshit. Before long, you fit start losing stuff at the same rate as the Titanic. Oh, sorry, all except this guy, Michael Handel, who, when he's not working at UFIT, is a world Othello champion. Throughout my life, I've been pretty much defined by the board game Othello. I've got to ask for time off at some point so I can go and play in these world championships. Now, the Armstrongs is such a bizarre programme, there's been quite a bit of debate as to how real it actually is, and certainly some of the exchanges are so ludicrous, you think this has got to be scripted. So if we increase our call rate, we've done what you've done without having to pay you. What was, was, and now what is, is, and is to tomorrow a new day? Yes, it is. Okay, that doesn't make any sense to me. And as for that episode where they went to France, I mean, God, come on, surely no one's that embarrassing? A clip in all the way round. Yeah, like I've always said, when you're abroad, continue speaking English, but just do it in the local accent. They always pick it up. Aluminium roof, PVC, turnbuckle, cleat, bang, bang, bang. It doesn't help that some of the shots look suspiciously staged. Thing is, if it's not real, it's a hell of an elaborate con. For one thing, UFIT is a real company. And furthermore, if you're checking out the backstory, a quick Google search throws up a site maintained by Michael, the weird Othello champion on which he's written the following dramatic tribute to his favourite strategic board game. Ah, what shall I say of Othello? This cauldron of revelling senses. This arena without mercy, without stain. The players shake hands. The clock is ticking. We dive into the clear blue opening sea, our destinies engraved within tiny black and white discs. Time slows. Time stares. Time shatters. The endgame erupts with a violent shower of crimson sparks. The game dies. Heralding another breathless challenge. Othello, forever. In the words of Richard Littlejohn, you couldn't make it up. I think the Armstrongs is real. But then my grip on reality has always been a bit lax, hasn't it, Marilyn? Yes! What? Yes, it has. What has? Your grip on reality. What's it been? Lax! I think I'm developing the thing that I ain't going to shit on nobody's head unless I have to. But when I do, it'll be from a very great height. Well, that's it for our series of three pilots. Hope you enjoyed the show. I know some of you didn't. Somebody called Charlie Broker, and apparently it's Charlie Broker's Scream Wipes. Uh, has been on Channel 4. Somebody half respectable has given this hack some airtime, and now he's got above his station. Bet he doesn't recall this. I bet you he doesn't see this come back at him. There he is, fairly talentless bloke, doesn't know very much. Uh, can, can splice a programme together very roughly uh, and c can poke fun thinking there's going to be no redress. Well, of course, there isn't on his programme. You won't see me on there again tell it, saying to the world how rubbish he is. Of course, you won't see that. Charlie, I'm offering you out. Hundred grand in the ring, you and me, mate. Come on. If you want to waste a half an hour of your life, which you will never get back again, Charlie Broker's Scream White BBC4. What a load of trash.